working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Hey there, Working Drummers. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Working Drummer Podcast. I'm Zach Albetta, and my interview today is with Ed Breckenfeld. I'm excited about this one because Ed is the first of what I hope to be more interviews with uh, drummers from Chicago. That city has a musical scene and history all its own, and as you'll hear from Ed, uh, should be high in the running for anyone thinking about where they might want to build a career in music. Ed is a rock drummer primarily and has enjoyed a career of over three decades doing live touring and session work with Chicago as his home base. He is also the author of the Modern Drummer magazine series Off the Record in which he transcribed and analyzed iconic drum parts from across multiple genres. This episode is sponsored by Sakai Drums. You know the Sakai sound, now get to know the Sakai name. Trusted around the world for almost 100 years, Sakai's devotion to craftsmanship and passion in creating the world's best quality drums is unmatched. Handcrafted in Osaka, Japan, Sakai offers the most versatile drums from the Trilogy Vintage Series to the modern almighty Japanese Birch Recording Kit, each boasting a distinct sound and feel. Go to SakaiDrums.com to learn why studio legend Eddie Bayers, the Smashing Pumpkins' Jimmy Chamberlain, and Tedeschi Trucks Band's J.J. Johnson and Tyler Greenwell choose Sakai. Elevate your sound with Sakai. That website, again, is S-A-K-A-E-Drums.com. So let's get to it with Ed Breckenfeld. The first chunk of this interview is a good long talk about Chicago that made me want to visit soon. And then Ed gets on to his experience with some great advice and stories that I think you'll find useful no matter where you live. Hope you dig it. Are you a lifelong Chicagoan? Yeah, born here uh, in the late 50s. Spent my whole life here. I spent one summer that I lived out in California looking for a record deal with a band. Uh huh. I just did, I think. Right. Uh, yeah, life, born and bred in Chicago. Wow. So, and then lived out in the suburbs. Uh huh. So I'm I've, I'm fascinated with with Chicago uh, as as a city and as just a sort of you know the, the culture of it and the lifestyle of it. I'm a big fan of Anthony Bourdain, uh, and when when he did an episode in uh, Chicago, he talked about you know L A is is just a sprawling metropolis and and New York is is just an abstract state of mind, but Chicago is a city. You know Chicago is a great American city. Um, so talk about just life in Chicago for you as a musician and, and also just for the average uh, Chicagoan. Uh, it's a big city and there's a lot of culture. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things to do for people. There's a lot, there's a big art scene. Um, it's a working city. Uh, it's interesting because it's a beautiful downtown right on Lake. Have you been to downtown Chicago? Yes, I've, I've made a couple of short visits to Chicago, but I want to make a, a long one at some point. <laughs> Lakefront is just gorgeous. You know, it's, it's, um, it's set up the way they set the city up is they way back in the day, you know, when the city was less than a hundred years old, they made a decision not to fill up the lake with, with factories. Mm-hmm parks and a boulevard called Lakeshore Drive. And, and so people from the city and from the parks can just look out onto the beautiful lake. So it's a, it's a very attractive city in that way. And there's a lot of, a lot of theater, a lot of places for bands to play, um, a lot of stage uh, plays um, and, you know, just things to do. So culturally it's a big city. Mm -hmm. When you get outside of that downtown area, it's like a collection of neighborhoods. They all have these interesting little names, and you know, musicians live in Wicker Park, or they live in uh, Lakeshore. You know, they, there's all these. They're just neighborhoods or collections of like maybe I don't know eight city blocks or so, and uh, they have their own identities. Um, some of them are you know artsy. Some of them are you know troubled inner city neighborhoods. I mean, I'm sure you hear about the violence in Chicago. Yeah, uh, it, it, you know it's it's a city made up of just about everything culturally that our country has to offer all in these little areas. Mm -hmm. It's progressive in a lot of ways. Uh, Illinois is pretty much democratic almost at every election. Right. <clears throat> There's a lot of money up on the North side of Chicago, both in the city and in the suburbs. And then there's a lot of poverty on the West side and then the South side too. So, 
from a standpoint of growing up and 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 working in Chicago, um, there's always been a ton of bars to play in. <laughs> yeah, bar scene has kind of gone up and down over the years, uh, depending upon you know what's happening in the economy and right music and all that. Uh, beyond that, there's a lot of theaters to play. There's the, the, the suburban area. And just about every suburb has uh, a community theater. Uh, there's a lot of colleges, small colleges around the city that have great theaters to play in. Um, so, you know, there's things to do. There's places to play. Uh, there's money to be made, kind of. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> there was before the downturn. Right. There used to be a big jingle scene in Chicago in the 90s and 2000s, 80s, 90s, into the 2000s, and mm -hmm. kind of dissipated. And I was on the peripheral of that. I wasn't, I was never right in there as a frontline guy, but I would get some calls. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of commercial work, a lot of radio commercials, TV commercials, doing the music for that. Right. I was, I was going to ask, like the, you know, Chicago obviously has a huge infrastructure for live music. Um, but how much of it, uh, how much of an infrastructure is there for, for session work aside from the, the jingle thing you were talking about, like in the nineties, what is, what is the landscape like today? Landscape today, you know, it's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of independent studios around the big studios have suffered. Like, like most music industry things have suffered. Uh, I actually have a session, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, down at a, a studio called CRC. It's Chicago Recording Company. Mm -hmm. Here's has been the biggest studio in Chicago. They've, they, you know, Smashing Pumpkins did their albums there. Uh, uh, who's the, uh, I can't think of the rap artist that was huge in the 90s. You were there all the time, throw parties and record all weekend. Right, right. So it's like the number one recording studio in Chicago. We recorded a lot of great bands there. They have like several rooms there. But they're they've gone to like video editing and movie editing and stuff, and they don't. I don't know how many actual sessions they do with live bands. It's certainly not as many as they used to. They they used to have three, four studios running all the time. Right. It's down since then. Mm -hmm. I don't. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It'll I'll, it'll be interesting to see what what it's like. Uh, beyond that, there's a number of independent studios around smaller studios. Some in the city. Steve Albini's uh, place is, is pretty well known. Uh, it's called Electric Audio. Um, and of course, he was you know well known for working with Nirvana and a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. That's a really cool place. And, and they work quite a bit. But um, I don't know that in this day and age, it's as busy as it was, say, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, as far as recordings go. Uh, I have a lot of being a lifelong Chicagoan and being you know in some bands that did pretty well around here mm -hmm. of connections with producers and artists that know me and stuff. So I get kind of a regular amount of work in various studios. Yeah. It could be home studios. I, I play in, you know, people's basements. Uh, some of them are professionally, you know, run studios, uh, dotted all over the suburbs and in Chicago. Right. Not to maybe make a living at, but enough to augment the teaching I do and the, the live work I do. It's kind of like a, my life is like a three-headed monster, it's, <laughs> and then some live shows as well. Yeah, yeah. And you're you're touching on a um, an aspect of networking, and we we talk about networking a lot on this podcast, obviously. Um, but I I think something that is not talked about enough is is just time and the amount of time that you that you have to spend in a place to really develop a, a dependable network and develop a good reputation. Um, I think a lot of the strategies that people talk about are, are sort of, you know, one year or two year or five year based strategies. But the, you know, the, 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 <laughs> there's a well kept secret or maybe the worst kept secret is that, you know, the, the best strategy you can have is staying in a place for, you know, 20 or 30 years. Well, that's probably true. You know, if you can afford to do it, um, you know, obviously I grew up here and I've, I've always found a way to, to work and live in this town it's, I think it's much more difficult when you go to a strange town and you only know a few people, mm -hmm. try to work and support yourself and make it happen. And then you're competing against people who have been there for 20, 30 years. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's a, it's a tough, it's a tough call to make in the nineties. Uh, I went down to Nashville several times 
with the thought of moving down there. It was just at the start of when the rock musicians were starting to move into Nashville. Right. I had a band, which we could talk about later, um, that had a record deal that, and it was kind of winding down. And I was thinking, okay, is Chicago where I want to spend the rest of my career? Would it be a good time to look into something else? I'd already been out in Los Angeles and didn't really care for the feel of that place. Mm -hmm. Although I have a family out there now and I go out there all the time. It's a wonderful town, but as far as a place I want to make music, yeah, very inhospitable. <laughs> it, it, it can be. I was there for five years and yeah, okay. uh, there's, there's a lot to love about it, uh, but there's a lot in the way. <laughs> well, I mean, I was getting, you know, word from my friends that it was like, okay, you will, you have to pay to play this club. you know? Right. Yeah. Chicago, you know, it's like you earn your living, you know, you don't pay people to for the chance to play in front of them. Right. Um, and then New York just seemed, you know, kind of too intimidating. And I'd played there several times with my old band. And, mm -hmm. But just the idea of trying to move to New York and survive. And, you know, when there's all the New York great drummers and how expensive it is, you know, right. stuff, it made a lot of sense because it, it, back in the early 90s, it was kind of cheap to live down there. Mm -hmm. Good time to go down and, and, uh, you know, I was pretty close to pulling the trigger. We, my wife and I went down, spent some time down there. I went down and went on an audition for, for like a 70s country band that was looking for a road drummer. And it mm -hmm. would have been a job and got me in the door, you know. And uh, and then, thing, you know, things started to pop up here in different ways. And, I, and plus family issues started to pop up here, too. So... When I look back on it now, I'm pretty glad I did because I, I make a pretty comfortable living here and I'm not, I'm at the point in my life, I'm in my late fifties where, you know, being the rock star, okay, that was a dream for yesteryear. Now I just, I just want to enjoy my craft. Yeah. If I do a session for somebody who's going to, who's going to press a thousand CDs or maybe you nobody know, presses CDs, hardly anybody does anymore, just put it on the internet or whatever. As long as I've done a good job, I could be happy with that. Mm-hmm paid me a decent rate and I went in and, and made music and it's like, I'm my own worst critic and I'm my own audience these days to, to keep myself on track. Right. Right. And that, that touches on something I was going to ask you. One, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you given your age is, you know, in the, in the music business, part of music, part of music is, is casting obviously, especially in a place like, uh, Nashville or LA or, or whatever. And, and as musicians age, like we, we kind of age out of certain types of gigs. So how ha, has that been a challenge for you? Have, have you kind of embraced, uh, you know, your, your aging process musically and otherwise? Um, I don't know that it's been a challenge. Um, you know, it's been an adjustment. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's funny. And I, I tell my wife this a lot. Um, Back when I was younger, when I first got going in, in drumming in the in the 70s and, you know, kind of seriously into it in the 80s when I had a couple of pretty successful bands, I was always like the my bands. <laughs> I, was always, I was always playing with older musicians, you know, and like the young up and coming guy, you know. And now that's kind of turned around where I'm generally probably the older guy in most of the bands I play in. Mm -hmm. You know, I've kept myself pretty well preserved so I don't. You know, I maybe, you know, I have people, if I tell them I'm in my late 50s, they're like, get out, you know, so <laughs> it helps, you know, but some of it too is, you, you know, the attitude you have. I mean, you, you know, you, you can't think like an old guy, you can't close your mind off. Right. But yeah, I mean, I got gray in my beard, you know, so that right away that, you know, shows that I'm a veteran musician and, and I'm not going to be available for some young kid band. But on the other hand, I'm not really right for some young kid band, right. you know? There are enough veteran musicians around Chicago that continue to call me that, you know, as long as we all stay healthy, uh, you know, we'll just ride into the sunset together. <laughs> that's that's a good point. Like I was I was thinking about that, how how we kind of, you know, we, we find our tribe as as younger musicians and. And that that crew, that tribe, whatever you're a part of, like you just you kind of you kind of age together, and the gigs you're on changes, but you're still together. That's true, I think, and 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 then you know those people will in a town as big as Chicago, those people will introduce you to other people that are in the same age group. Now, I will work with young artists in the studio. I do a lot of recording for like I just just did one for a 17 year old girl about ready to go off to some. 
um, Ivy League college, a country singer songwriter, country pop. And a producer that knows me called me. He's like, I think you're right for this project. And we went and did five songs for her. Um, you know, she's 17 years old, you know, and, uh, you know, I sometimes I think about the, you know, the, the kid like that's going to walk in and see, you know, a guy in his 50s. And right. Like, but she looks at us, the guys in the band, like these are the sessions, the season session pros. Right. And I try to interpret what she's looking for, uh, despite the age difference. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the producers that hire me may be, you know, some of them are my age, some of them are younger. Um, they may hire, uh, hire other is, uh, musicians that are my age or younger. Uh, but a lot of times the artists are younger. Right. The violin artist himself will hire me and he's my age. And he's a classic rocker and remembers a band I was in or saw me play some show with one of some band that I play with now. And then I'll get a call from, you know, because of that. Yeah. So, but I, I think it's a valid point. You know, you, you, wherever you are, you're going to, make those connections. And if you're lucky, you'll keep those connections. And if you're lucky, those people will become successful. And that becomes your, your, like you said, your tribe. A lot of my students, I do a lot of teaching. And the ones that are heading off to college, my advice to them is, look, when you're picking a college, if you're going to go into music, and there's a lot of great music programs in colleges all over the country now, um, pick a town you might want to hang around in. I've had two people now go down to Nashville uh, and they both, I think went through the engineering schools at two different, two different universities, Vanderbilt. And there's another one down there. Um, I can't think of the name of it, but they were looking at that and they were looking at some college in Minnesota and another one in somewhere else. And I'm like, well, think about this. You're going to go through this school probably four years in Nashville with a bunch of people your age these people will be graduating graduating out into a town that's ready for music. That's, yeah. So why not go there and make friends with these people? And if you can't get into the scene where the veteran musicians are, you're going to have your schoolmates. And you guys put something together yourself. Mm-hmm. One of them just did that. He started his own recording studio with a couple of schoolmates from the school he was in. Yeah. They got, and they've got a little studio on the outskirts of Nashville, and they're going to make a go of it. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, and uh, on on that note, it seems like Chicago is is a great place to to do that because there are tons of great schools and a huge music scene. Yes, there, it's true. Uh, Columbia College is really has a really good program. A friend who uh, is high up in the music department down there, and he brings me down every once in a while for clinics and things like that. Um, and they have a really good school down there, um, and it's a magnet. They're, they're bringing kids in from all over the country to come to Columbia. It's right on the lakefront, so it looks – it's gorgeous. You yeah. know, but it's, you know, intensely uh, into the music scene down there. And then they have these kids. They put these ensembles together and have them play the local clubs. They have them record in their studios or other studios. That You know, they partner with studios. And these guys are you know, meeting other young musicians. And, you know, several of them have come out of there and, you know, formed bands or – Going into, you know, to other aspects, going into engineering, you know, there's just, there's a lot going on in, in Chicago for people that want to come here to go to school, for sure. Yeah. But there's been great bands that have come out of Chicago and they're, um, it's a great, t- it's a great loyal town to outside musicians, you know, to, to national and international musicians. I mean, usually musician artists will come through and play Chicago and they'll be like, we have to get back to Chicago because the audience. <laughs> love they love live music you know mm. this news that happens every every summer in chicago you know four days of just like thousands and thousands of kids descending on the lakefront and seeing all these different bands it's a it's a highlight of the summer and people come from all over the country to see it and it's the the chicago audiences are appreciative of live talent mm-hmm. know that they go to the bars to see the local bands as much anymore and some of that is you know, there's too many other things to do. Right. Uh, you know, so, uh, but every suburb has, has festivals, you know, throughout the summer and they, you know, they hire mid-level bands and big bands and small bands. And, um, people will come out and see, see talent. Yeah. It's, it's the same in Atlanta. There's uh there, there are tons of festivals like going into the 
going into the early summer in the middle of summer it's just too damn hot to do anything um but in the you know in the spring and early summer and then in the late summer and the fall there are just these tons of festivals like you said each neighborhood has a has a bunch of festivals um and and people just really dig live music i think outside of nashville and la and maybe even new york i think there's a there's a more down to earth um appreciation for for live music on the local level um in those in those other cities yeah i th- i think um you know you can sit home and look at your screens for as long as you want but at some point you know especially if you're a young person with some energy and you want to get out and be with other people you know there's nothing like that sh- live shared event thing it's it's what makes people still go to movie theaters yeah years ago they were predicting the downfall of movie theater you know like what you know, now that people have you know widescreen television and and streaming access to anything they want to see why would they go to a theater you know but there's something about that let's get a group of people together and experience this together yeah uh and you know the concert scene in in chicago is you know there's several big places to play in bands every band comes and plays through chicago it's a it's an important stop sometimes the highlight of certain bands tours right right that have broke out of chicago that weren't from chicago that have like you know kind of first conquered chicago and used that as a springboard right yeah yeah it's it is a um there's a lot going on in this town. When I first moved to Atlanta, um, I'd only been here like a, a couple weeks and, and I was at a, a bar seeing some music um, and I went into the bathroom and uh, on the on the mirror of the bathroom, there was a sticker that said, there is a hole in your heart that only local music can fill. <laughs> and I looked at that. I was like, I'm, I'm going to be OK here. I like it here. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, on the smallest level, you have to kind of seek that out and I, I couldn't really if you talk to some of the other Chicago musicians that you might be thinking about talking to they would be able to probably tell you especially see I live outside of the city mm-hmm. down in the city would know nowadays you know where the cool places are to see original bands right you know I was always about original music that was that was all I ever really wanted to do was you know my own band where we wrote our songs I I've been lucky enough to work with some really good songwriters um but there's a huge cover scene in chicago too and it probably is the same in atlanta everywhere it, it, like tribute bands and and you know not just cover bands band, like i was talking about this with somebody the other day it's it's a thing now for bands to have this like uh it's almost a theater piece you know with with costumes and like it's a full-on reenactment i i play with with a female singer that does a share show <laughs> that's great <laughs> And she, you know, and she plays the tracks. You know, it's the one thing that I do where I'm playing the tracks. I, I try to avoid that if I can. Mm-hmm. Not, you know, because I'm altruistic or anything. I just I enjoy playing more if I'm not doing that. Right. I understand the needs of the show. You know. Um, so, but there are a lot of bands out there that are, and I I think it's, you know, they're playing the tracks because people are expecting tribute shows to sound just like the record. Mm-hmm. And audiences no longer care whether you play the tracks or not. Yeah. They're big cover band uh, around Chicago. They play mostly the suburbs and they do like kind of a journey, uh, sticks, uh, rush, you know, that, that, that era of band. Yeah. They, they do it with five guys, one singer, uh, keyboard, drum, drums, guitar, and bass, I think. But they, they play to all background vocals, tracks, and a lot of key parts, and anything else is all on tracks. Everything's tracked. Mm-hmm. And they don't dress up like the bands they play. They do one step better. <laughs> they, they put a huge video screen over the stage and play the video of the band <sighs> song that they're playing. Wow. So nuts for this. That's amazing. Can you imagine that? I mean, <sighs> ten, even 10 years ago, we people would have laughed and you know and now and nowadays audiences are like yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean i can't put those guys down because they're they make good bucks you know yeah they, you can't be can't be mad at a good idea man yeah they found a niche and they know that well, okay as long as people are accepting playing the tracks let's go one step better right. let's, <laughs> we're playing you know wow. if we press like them we'll show the video the, the original video so i mean that's kind of there is a part of the music industry that that is 
happening that I, you know, I'm only on the peripheral of, thank goodness. And uh, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't interest me because I, like I said, I like to work on people's songs. I like to play original music. Have you played uh, very many blues gigs over the years? Not really. And that's a good question because Chicago is, you know, like one of the blues capitals. Yeah. I've never been too drawn to straight up blues mm-hmm. as, as far as the performance side. Right. Love to listen to it. And, you know, I've done a lot of bluesy rock stuff. You know, when you're around great guitar players, a lot of them gravitate towards that. Yeah. So I've played a lot of Chicago style shuffles, um, but I haven't really actually worked steadily with a blues band. Right. Well, it, the reason I ask, it's it's something I'm interested in. Like, you know, I, I recently moved to Atlanta, so I'm I'm getting hip to, you know, Southern blues, to that Delta blues tradition. Um, I talked recently to a drummer named Michael Duffy, who has been in L.A. for years, but spent a long time in Austin, Texas. So I talked with him a little bit about, you know, Texas blues and, and what makes that. Um, but, I, yeah, I'm curious to ask you, just as, as a drummer or as a listener, um, what, what are kind of the, the hallmarks of, of Chicago blues? And who are, the, who, are, who are the hallmarks of Chicago blues? Buddy Guy is probably the most... right. Uh, famous of all and you, you know you see him in the news around here he's kind of he's an icon mm-hmm. you know rightfully so I mean the, he was an amazing guitar player for many many years yeah there there have been a number of of great blues musicians to come to you know to make Chicago their home that either came from outside or, or grew up in Chicago mm-hmm. for years uh, Lonnie Brooks was a big name in Chicago and I'm not sure if he came from Mississippi originally for he was a Chicago guy mm-hmm. and Got a son named Ronnie Brooks, Ronnie Baker Brooks, who's awesome, carrying on his, in his uh, in his um, legacy. And uh, um, Coco Taylor is another long, long time Chicago. Yeah, you mentioned the Chicago Shuffle, like from just from the drumming standpoint. Can you can you speak to any details? Yeah, I always call the Chicago Shuffle kind of that two handed shuffle, which is like you know both hands are playing the shuffle together in unison. Heavy backbeat. Yeah, cool. It, you know, so one on the snare and one on the ride or the hi hat or whatever, and that, you know, probably with a quarter note kick drum. To me, right. that's a little heavy, big Chicago feel to it. Yeah, the backbeat is huge in blues in Chicago. That's that you know that driving, that driving two four. Yeah, it's uh, it, in in for for Texas blues. When I was talking to Michael Duffy, I, I asked him about like you know sort of the drumming um, aspects of it, and he was like, it's all quarter note. Like he didn't talk about the heavy backbeat. He just said it's all quarter note, and and you know this the the quarter note is is the steady, and the skip beat is the wobble. You know he talked about it like a woman's hips. Like the feet are the quarter note, and the hips are your snare. <laughs> I was like he was a great guy to talk. About. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool. Chicago has a, a great drumming legacy, it seems like. But I mean, one of the iconic drum shops, Vix, is is in Chicago, and and they have the the uh, uh, Chicago drum show every year. Talk about just the, the drumming, drumming community and the, the uh, fraternity of drummers in Chicago. That's been going on for many, many years. When I was a kid, uh, there was a, uh, a store called Frank's Drum Shop down on, uh, right down in the, in the Loop area, our city. And it was a place where you, you know, it was up on a third floor, you'd take an elevator up and you, the elevator opened up and it was like in an office building. And it was just wall to wall wall drums. Wow. Signed pictures from Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa and all these all over the walls. It's just an iconic place. There's a a place in New York City that reminds me of that too, and I can't think of the name of it. Um, So that place ran for years and years, and I I bought a snare drum when I did from that place. They kind of went on hard times. Um, The the drum shops in the, I would say, 70s, 80s, and uh, Kind of moved out to the suburbs, maybe because Reds were, uh, and there was a great one called the Drum Pad up in Palatine. Mm-hmm. One called Midwest Percussion down on the South Side. Um, now, in the you know in the last fifteen years or so, Vix is certainly one. And uh, uh, there's a uh, Steve Maxwell. I can't remember if that's his name. There's a, a guy that started down in the, the uh, Mammoth Music. Mart downtown, uh-huh. a uh, a shop out in the suburbs, uh, and it's a lot of vintage stuff and a lot of a lot of uh, new stuff as well. 
Um, so yeah, there's always been great drum shops around to, to go to. Um, and I think, uh, the, the real pros in town go to those shops as opposed to your guitar centers. And, yeah. Uh, I having been teaching out of a music store out close where I live, pretty much get most of my supplies out of there. So I, I haven't really in the last few years felt the need to go into the city unless I have to look for something I can't find, you know, out here. Um, but you know, the, the uh, I think, I think Vix is, you know, probably the classic place. Um, yeah. Who are some of your favorite uh, drummers around town as far as your, your colleagues and contemporaries? Uh, my good friend that I was telling you about in uh, that did the, the stage plays, um, his name is Dan Leali. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the one that did Million Dollar Quartet and Blue Man Group. He's got a really cool band called, uh, speaking of tributes, called Tributosaurus. <laughs> I think I've heard of this. Oh, they're great, and they're nuts too. They they do a different show every month. Wow! A club in the city, a couple clubs in the city they play at, and they just take out a different band. And their thing is they have no interest in looking like the band. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're all longtime Chicago musicians, and they know everybody in town. They'll just augment their band to do whatever they need to do. Uh, so if they're doing Wind and Fire, they'll bring in a horn section. If they do, you know. Go ahead. I, well, I, I was just having a realization that I think uh, my, my buddy Jeff Freeling, who is a guitarist, now lives in Kansas City, um, but I, he lived in Chicago for a long time, and I'm pretty sure that, that he was part of that, or maybe still is on an occasional basis. The guy that's, that sat in with them a bunch, they, they just have they have four, five core guys, and then they'll just augment. Right. I did a show with them last year. Dan called me up, and he's like, you want to do double drums? We're doing an Alma Brothers show. Oh, man, that's so great. So awesome. It was so much fun. Uh, so Danny's really a uh, great pro and, and a sweet guy, just a really good drummer. He'd be somebody to talk to if you were interested. Yeah. There's a, a longtime Chicago musician named uh, uh, Nick Tremulous. Nicholas Tremulous is his stage name. Been around Chicago for a long time. Uh, his drummer is a guy named Larry Beers, and Larry's a wonderful player. Uh, definitely, you know, somebody that you'd want to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, then there's other guys that have come out of here that have, you know, done really well for themselves. I mean, Jimmy Chamberlain. Right. Was, you know, he's a huge talent. Mm-hmm. Out in L.A. nowadays, but, you know, he uh, he certainly, the Pumpkins came, he became huge out of Chicago, and, and he's, a, he's a wonderful player. Yeah. I want to talk to you about teaching. Um because you, uh, I was I was reading your bio on Drummer Zone or somewhere, and and it says you went to art school briefly. I did. I was going to be an illustrator, and you know, thank God I I didn't do that because you know everything's done on computer nowadays. I was a you know a, a hand drawn uh, a, a, a painter and drawer in high school, and I loved it. Right. To a commercial art school down in Chicago, uh, but at the same time I was playing in bands, you know, and everybody else was working on their art and I was gigging and trying to go to school at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So like as, as someone who, who worked his way into a professional career without going to college, um, how do you, how do you approach the students you have now who, who do want to go to college? I mean, do you, do you dissuade some of them from going to college and saying that you don't have to do this? Oh, I, I think things are a lot different than they were. You know, I would have gone to college in the late seventies. Mm. Pretty much everything was jazz programs in those days. And I, you know, I'm a I'm a rock drummer. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what I listen to. That's what I love. Uh, all aspects of rock drumming, and then that that spills over into country, which pretty much sounds like rock these days, anyway. Right. So um, I wasn't really. I didn't really feel the draw. You know the drawn to the jazz programs and I, and I played it, you know, with jazz band and swing choir in high school and all that, but I wasn't, I was looking at the music programs in those days and it was pretty much heavyweight jazz. And I, and I wanted to be in a rock band. I wanted to make music. I wanted to record albums. And I didn't really see that at that time that there were too many schools kind of offering that type of a program where nowadays, I mean, it's like schools everywhere are embracing all types of music and there's, and their music departments have expanded and there's music business courses you can take and there's um, engineering courses, all that stuff that wasn't available back in those days. So I tell my students now, if you want to do 
you know, music in college, you're going to meet people and you're going to learn. It's going to be a great networking thing. Go, go for it. Just don't expect that you can walk out with a music degree and hand it to somebody and that's going to get you a gig. Right. You're going to want to play as much as you can and, and develop your connections and develop your voice and your instrument. Mm -hmm. But going to school is a way to do that too. You know, so there's, um, you know, there's some who don't do that and they, they do it the old school way of just trying to get into a band and make it happen right out of high school. Um, and that's fine too. You know, you, you have to kind of follow where you're, where you think, you know, the right path is for you. You know, you go with your instincts in a situation like that. Yeah. I give the, a lot of my students the hard, uh, advice of, look, if there's something else you can do that, that you're good at, right. Is, has a higher probability of success than music, then you should pursue that. Yeah. Go do that and do, and minor in some music courses or something Cool, you know? Right. That that keeps coming up on this podcast. Uh, you know, the notion that if, if there's anything else you're inclined to do, like an, unless you have a gun to your head and music is the only thing that you are interested in doing and you have to do it, then, you know, it might not be for you. <laughs> because I think it's been proven over the years that the people who go into it kind of high in the sky expecting something to happen are the ones that are out of it before. Mm hmm. Um, I never got out of it because I just loved to, to play. You right. know? That goal, I had that burning desire to make albums, you know, and it's kind of funny because albums are kind of, a, you know, it's a, di it's a dying art. Right. You know, the album itself is a dying art. Mm -hmm. I did with that piece of vinyl, you know, and, and like looking at those liner notes, reading, you know, who the drummer was and listening to that music. It just, I, w I wanted to be part of that. Yeah, that's was my driving force, and it still is my driving force. You know, to to make great music and to play with great musicians, and there's nothing else that I do in my life um, that measures up to that. You know, that I could see there was there was never a point in my life where I was like, "Geez, I'm not making enough as a musician. I better can this and go do something else." It, right. You know, one thing led to another to another, and I was always able to keep myself alive and. You know, I'm not a rich person, but I make a decent living and, you know, I have a decent house and, you know, I'm yeah. happy. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole ball game there, man. I have a friend who's a, uh, who was a great guitar player that I played with in, well, this is going back to maybe 1980, 79, 80. Excellent guitar player. Mm -hmm. he, he, he was like a Pete Townsend type of a uh, lanky, you know. Like could command the stage. He had an opportunity to become a bonds trader, and through uh, through his father's business, and he decided to cash in guitar and go trade bonds. Mm -hmm. He's you know he's got a retirement home in Florida, and he lives in beautiful in, in Denver. He's got a you know he owns his company now. He's like doing like you know five times better than I am. Mm -hmm. But. You know, he's like, every time I talk to him, he's like, God, I'm so happy you're still playing, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. like he cashed in the music uh, lifestyle for, you know, to live a secure life and make money. And and I think there's a lot of guys out there who, you know, wish they didn't have to do that. You know? Right, right. And it's not, you know, it's it's hard to talk about that without it sounding like uh, like you're you're making a judgment on on their choice. No, I would never make that judgment because, you know, he's got things that I, I don't have. Right, right. Security that I don't have. You know, I'm a working musician. I could, if something happens to, you know, me physically and I can't play, I'm, I'm out of luck. Right. You know? or, or, you know, any number of things could happen. So, you know, my life has been a gamble. Mm -hmm. Never look down upon somebody for, for giving that up. You know? Right. But I, I was going to say at the at the same time, you know, we all we've all been on that gig where, you know, the, the guy comes up to you afterwards and, and he's a, you know, a bonds trader or a doctor or, or something. And he says, man, I, I used to play. I, I wish I wish I wouldn't have given it up, you know, and and you never hear a musician say, you know, I, I, I wish I wouldn't have given up being a doctor. <laughs> well, I've heard a couple go, you know, when they're broke, go like, <laughs> so, you know, you, you make your choices and you you go with what you think your strength is, you know, if your strength is my strength was drumming, I was a better drummer than an artist. And when I was in art school, I was looking at these other kids that were way better than I was. And I thought I was pretty good. And then mm -hmm. I saw what the competition was like, 
And then I thought, okay, I'm going to get out of this school. It was a two-year school. And I'm going to have to go compete with these guys who are better than me for whatever couple of jobs are available. Just like coming out of music school, you know, mm-hmm. if you're going through music school. I had a student who went through, um, he majored in music business and minored in, in, uh, uh, music. He played, you know, he played drums through college, mm-hmm. uh, but he was looking at these other players that were like, I'm not going to be able to compete with these guys. I'm good, but I'm not that good. So he went into the business side, hmm. you know? knowing that that was more of his strength. He was a personable guy and, and he liked that side of it, you know? So you, you have to decide if you, if you're going to be a professional musician, I think it's only because a, you have the burning desire B, you know, you, you can do it and C, you don't give up. Yeah. You know, you just, you find a way you put in your 10,000 hours and you play with as many people as possible. And you, you, you know, you go after it. You, you follow that dream. Yeah. A burning desire don't do it right right you know do you find that that uh your students of of the younger generation are, are maybe more pragmatic about a career in music than most of them will tell me i'm not going i'm not going into music <laughs> with them you know like they start to do pretty well and i'll be like oh you know i'll be i'll be i always say this to my better students i'll be like, um i say i'll be knocking at the stage door to see you when you're on tour you know and right that old guy, get that old guy out of here. <laughs> and they'll, they'll laugh and they'll be like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do music. I'm, you know, I'm into the, I want to be a programmer or I want to wow. be, you know, I'm going to go into engineering or yeah. something. Well, that, that's even more extreme than I was, I was thinking of. Cause like I've, I've met musicians, uh, 10 or 15 years younger than me who, um, are they they just have a, a totally different mentality about it than I did when I was 20 like people people are writing songs hoping they'll get picked up for a commercial you know right. um so i i think the younger generation is much more business savvy and 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 views music not as a as a vehicle for their own artistic expression but like it's a business i, I if i'm going to make money at this i have to be savvy i have to be open to you know whatever professional commercial business opportunities come my way and, and, you know, not, uh, stick to my guns as an artist or maintain my creative integrity or whatever. Well, part of the cynicism of the time and it's, and it's, it's, it's rightfully so, you know, because the, the, you, you know, to survive, you have to be pragmatic. And that idea that, you know, like we used to have, like someone's going to come along and sign our band, you know, some on, you know, some big label is going to come and get, you know, how often does that even happen anymore? And sometimes you'll talk to artists that'll be like, I don't want to get signed to a label. You know, what would I want to do that for? You know, mm-hmm. I'll pay to bank this project on my own and make it happen so that I can keep all the control. Right, right. Stories of bands not getting paid their royalties and bands um, owing record labels huge amounts of money and all that stuff. That's, you know, that's all out there for people to learn from. And, you know, hopefully the... Younger musicians have learned from the mistakes of the past. I, I I think that's great. I mean that that's and that's a lot. I think from the information age because you can find out about all that stuff now. Mm-hmm. You know, a big mystery anymore. It used to be such a mystery. Like how does a band get signed? And well, oh, we just have to get really good and have somebody see us. You know. Now there's so many other ways to expose your talent and avenues to to pursue. You know, it's it's a it's a different world. Talking about your love of, of records and your love of songs and your love of songwriters, um, that I think speaks directly to your your modern drummer series uh, off the record. So talk a little bit about what what gave you the idea to do that and and what uh, you know what you wanted to help drummers develop and achieve with that. So off the record came about um, again. It was an ex student actually who wound up. He went through a music business program in the 90s, wound up in New York City working for some small label and then answered an ad for a, uh, a writer for Modern Drummer magazine in New Jersey. So he wound up in Modern Drummer and then he became kind of an assistant editor and a writer and he was looking for stuff to, d- to do. He's like, you know, the magazine needs content. So he contacted me and said, hey, Ed, I have an idea. Why don't you come up with some technique articles? And I wasn't educated as a writer. Um, but I had ideas, you know, all of, after all the years of teaching I've done. So I, I generated a couple of ideas and he put the writing together for it. And 
so I started showing up in that magazine, I think in 1999, I want to say, occasionally, once once every three months or so with, you know, some article on some technique, the six-stroke roll or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So um, then his editor began to like the stuff I was doing, and they actually had the idea for Off the Record. I guess someone had done that in the 80s. I don't know if you how far back you go with Modern Drummer. Um, I I had them since the, they first started. I mean, I was, you know, I loved that magazine right when it first came out. Yeah. So somebody in the 80s had done, they'd come up with that idea off the record at that time, and they just did a really kind of bare bones, you know, here's a couple of drum beats from this album. Kind right. Of so, and then it had gone away, and they had it in the back of their minds, they wanted to bring it back, and, and my uh, ex-students... Uh, the chief, the editor in chief decided um, to offer me the column, and he's like, "I want to bring off the record back, but I want you to expand it, and you know, and basically, you'll take an album, listen to it, and pick out what you think are the coolest drum licks, and just write them out." Yeah. And it was perfect for me because I had, for years, I had helped students figure out stuff. I mean, I going back to Neil Pert in the '80s, that was a big right. Getting going as a teacher, I had a lot of kids coming in. And, what is he doing on this? You know, <laughs> and and in those days, it was putting the needle on the record, you know, or running the cassette back. Yeah, you know? um, and I'd figure out what it was and transcribe it. So I I was pretty good at hearing and transcribing stuff, and so it seemed like a natural fit. So uh, I took on that column, and it ran for about ten years, just about every month. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, yeah, my idea was just you know for the guy drummer who's listening to whatever album and hears something go by and it just wonders what was that or how do I figure that out I wanted to to talk about it and write it out for him and show him exactly what it was yeah and it, it seems to um, it seems to promote a, an understanding of, of how drums can fit into a song like a lot of those technique articles in modern drummer and other magazines are they're they're very technique based. You know, and and it can be hard to sort of conceptualize how I'm going to use whatever this is in an actual song. Absolutely. And I think that's what drew me to it. You know, when they when he described it, I went back and found a couple of the old issues that it was in. He said, you know, check out this issue from 1988 or whatever. And I had it in my, you know, my back pile of magazines and I saw what they were doing. and And I thought, well, this, yeah, this is kind of more along my philosophy in that. You know, because I've always wanted to, to make music and drums is my vehicle for doing that, I always try to think like a musician rather than a drummer, you mm-hmm. know. And yes, I love a hot lick just like every drummer does. <laughs> but ultimately, if you want to if you want to make music and you want to work in this business, you're going to play for the song. You're not going to play for yourself. You're mm-hmm. going to play. And sometimes the needs of the song is a hot lick. You know, it's, it's, someone says, come up with that lick. You know, I, I see you doing a one measure fill right here. And it's got to be like mind blowing, you know, right. you technique to pull that off. But that doesn't happen that often. Most of the time it's like, you know, give me a real spare drum part and then throw in a couple of flourishes here and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've learned over the years as a recording musician uh, that, you know, that's, that's what draws me to drumming is coming up with just the perfect part and the cool lick in just the right area to make a part of the song jump out. So I was trying to find those areas, you know, like listen to how I would write, you know, here's this lick and listen to how it sets up this vocal or how it, how it, you know, uh, transitions into the bridge, you know, perfectly with this particular rhythm or whatever. Yeah. It's important to me. I mean, I, I think that that's a, that was a, uh, a pretty important point to get across in those. It wasn't just like, here's a lick and go play it all, all the way through every song, you know? Right. Think about how these things work. Yeah. I was thinking about this the other day, like, you know, no matter, no matter how you try and slice it, the drum set is an accompaniment instrument. Yes. And there are a select few who have turned it into a, a lead instrument or a solo instrument and, and done that successfully. But at its at its core, it it is an accompaniment instrument, um, and I I think uh, the more the more we can focus on on that role, uh, the the better off we're going to be. It's the first thing I I it's you I use exactly those terms 
the first thing I tell brand new students, whether they're little bitty kids or, or adults, and I teach a fair amount of adults too, um, if they're just starting out, I will say, look, you have to understand you are on an accompanying instrument. You're not going to make music on this instrument yourself. You're, you need to play with other musicians. Mm -hmm. And that you're going to have to find situations to play in. You're going to have to find people to play. Maybe a school band. It may be your next door neighbor. It may be, if you're an adult, it may be talking to the guys in your office to find out who else plays guitar so you can jam. Right. To really understand what, what our instrument does. You can learn the techniques. I can show you the drum beats and fills and, and you know different feels that you need to know to play different types of songs. But you know, ultimately, you've got to get in there and play those. And better with live musicians than trying to play a recording where there's already another drummer and you're following him. When you play with people, you don't follow. You lead. Mm. You're the you lead the, the music, right? It's right. your sense of time. It's your groove. You have to figure out how that works, and the only way to do it is is with people, right? And 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 it's not just leading; it's it's literally leading from behind. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> that's why you. That's where your your as a player, your your personality and your and your uh, your conviction to where the groove is important. You know, you need to you you know you need to kind of without sounding egotistical, you need to kind of bend the band to your will when it comes to that. Yeah. Well, there'll be guys in the band that'll fight you over that. Mm -hmm. Over, you may have the singer saying, "Look, I think you're playing that too aggressively, or you're too on top of the beat here." You know, if they're really canny and they can even, you know, know what that is, you know, you'll get you'll take your input from everybody in the band because you know they they will want to influence what you do. But once the song is on, it's yours. You know? Yeah. And I think the biggest compliment. I think I, I ever got from another musician, a non-drummer musician, was someone, a guitar player that I worked with years ago, told me, look, Ed, wherever you go, I follow. <laughs> and that, if you can get people to tell you that, you're on the right track. Yeah. Have their confidence that, you know, even if you take them down the blind alley, they're going to go with you. Right. You know? And you need that as a drummer. You need that ability to, to, to control the, the rhythm of the, of the song. Yeah. You know? Something else the uh, the off the record thing got me thinking about was anytime I'm I, I hear a song or I'm learning a song and the the drum part is somehow really cool or really unique or or something that I would never think to do um, I I always wonder if that's the result of like a really intentional uh, you know writing process and 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 coming up with this part and multiple minds working on it or if it was just the drummer's instinct to do that and it just came out that way and and you know sometimes it's obvious one and obviously the other um, but what what has doing this column for so long taught you about um, you know how how drum parts are created in terms of like really intentional orchestration versus just pure instinct you know I, I don't know that without talking, to the artist, you know, to the drummer, um, and getting into his mind, you know, which would have been maybe the next step for off the record would be to actually tag it into an interview, mm -hmm. you know, um, to actually sit down and say, okay, look, I've transcribed these licks. What were you thinking? Or how did you come up with this groove? But I guess that's why you read a magazine like Modern Drummer, you know, just because they will ask those questions. And, to how something was created, you know, I, probably maybe the one of the most famous um, examples of that would be uh, Fifty Ways to Leave Your Lover. Mm -hmm. You know the story behind? Yeah, Gad was just screwing around, basically, right? Playing a little that little marching kind of thing, and I don't know if it was Paul Simon himself or the producer who said, "Hey, that's cool. Keep, keep do that. You know, develop that more." You know, and then. You know, let's open the song with it, you know, because it's so interesting. Yeah. And now, did he sit down at home and think, this is the drum beat I'm going to use for, for this Paul Simon song? Probably not. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he was working on it in his practice and just was warming up. And, they, and you know, and you've probably been on sessions where that's happened, where you're, you just play something off the cuff and somebody goes, wait, that's it. Right. And I, I've done that to other people, like the guitarist or the bassist will just be dicking around and I'll be like, wait a minute, I, I want to play with that. Well, that's all in the creative process, and and um, 
you know, bands that work together constantly, I think, develop that. Mm -hmm. It's like, like a, it's the conversation we're having right now. It's a musical conversation where you, you play with somebody and you, then you kind of, one thing influences another and maybe in a certain type of a band it influences the drummer to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the stuff I was doing in off the record was there was some progressive stuff in there and where, you know, those drummers were intentionally trying to not play two and four, right. You know, trying to move away from that. Right. Or the metal stuff that I did where, you know, they were, they were obviously looking to, to expand on just a straight groove and, and that fit that, you know, that genre. Um, but I, I, you know, like 50 ways, I find it fascinating when somebody, that in a pop song right um like for example i think that the drum beat in uh taylor swift's shake it off is fabulous yeah a fabulous beat yeah that yeah, sounds like a real drummer playing that i don't know if, it, if i don't know the story behind that beat but you know i'm assuming that a lot of that stuff is just a you know a program or a loop but that sounds like a real guy pulling off that drum beat mm -hmm. open hi-hats and funny spots and it's great. I've and, I've played it like on wedding bands, and it's it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> it's weird. I had to do it for a corporate show last spring, and uh, it was just on the set list for a for a corporate gig. I got called on, and uh, so I went and transcribed that beat, and I started practicing it. I'm like, this is gonna take a little bit of playing to get a comfort level on this thing. Yeah, that that I, I'm I'm glad to hear that that another drummer found that beat like left-handed and weird because I don't, you know, my most of my most of my background uh is is in jazz and it's only in the last few years that I've gotten heavy into pop and rock and and whatever. Um so I I thought maybe it was just my jazz brain that was having trouble with this pop beat. Um from a rock drummer standpoint, it is left-handed weird, and, and it pretty much is left-handed. It makes most sense to play it kind of open-handed. Like oh, that. really? I think so. Um, but it's uh, it, you know, it's just a, a, a brilliant piece of design. Yeah, you know, kind of stuff. And I love hearing that when that thing first came on the radio. It was like cool, you know. Yeah. And I don't know about a drum beat in a pop song anymore, you know, because everything's pretty much you know quarter note. Uh, kick drum and yeah, you know, so that's I love seeing that kind of stuff, and that that's a good example of a drummer trying to come up come up with something fresh in you know in a genre that's not fresh, you know? right? <laughs> not so fresh. I think the greatest drummers are the guys who are able to, to to do that, and and sometimes it doesn't even take tremendous technique to do that too. You know, it's like um, I mean, you know, think about the beat that Meg White played in uh, the the famous hit of theirs, uh, Seven Nation Army. Yeah. I mean, it's floor time and kick drum on quarter notes and then add the backbeat in the chorus and put that quarter note triplet in there and it's magic. Yeah. As simple as you can play. Right. But, you know, it does. it's not always about the, the, the technique. Mm-hmm. Unless you need it, you know that's the that's the the key. Yeah. So you know, if you need that technique, you better go after it. You mentioned uh, the the bands that you uh, kind of got started with in, in the late seventies and eighties. Um, talk about talk about that experience and and you know the music industry at that time and and those bands specifically. Okay. Um, I knocked around in the seventies, uh, you know. Um, playing in some original bands that never really did too much. And then I, I got uh, into a band in 1980 called The Odd, which was kind of like an Elvis Costello band, but also with a girl singer involved, mm -hmm. too. The lead singer had kind of an Elvis Costello thing. He was a real good songwriter. And right at that time in Chicago, um, there was a real... Um, uh, there was a kind of a groundswell of of the kind of new wave punk pop thing starting to take over the clubs and before that in the 70s um there was a lot of singer songwriter stuff going on a lot right of, uh jazz in the in the chicago clubs and then kind of more of the arena rock bands playing in the suburbs mm -hmm. but around 1979 and 80 all of a sudden the kind of i would call it punk but not hardcore punk more like new wave you like the power pop and those types of yeah 
those bands were starting to do pretty well in the club. So the odd became one of those. And uh, we got signed to um, uh, Jam Productions Management Wing. And Jam Productions was the big concert promoter. So the wonderful experience was, here I was in my early 20s, all of a sudden, Jam is putting us on all these shows. So, you know, we're, we go from playing these little clubs to opening up for uh, the Romantics and the Talking Heads and Split Ends and all these bands that are coming through the city. And we're yeah. playing theaters, and it was it was fabulous. It was just like, this is what it's going to be like if something happens. You know, It was, it was Cheap Trick around at... Trick, but they came up kind of. They played the bar scene around Chicago in the seventies. Mm -hmm. By that time, they had really made their splash, and they were doing pretty right. Well. Okay, with it to the concert scene. But yeah, in the seventies, they were a club band around Chicago. Right from Rockford, so which is about two hours drive from Chicago. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so the odd did pretty well, and then it kind of flashed and fell apart in about two years, and mm -hmm. that scene evolved. A um, couple years later, then I uh, drew a couple of musicians that were in that scene um, and a different band that used to play with the odd. Um, we put together a band called The Insiders. And that was probably out of all the bands I've been in, that was my heart band. That was my band that I I devoted about 10 years of my life to trying to make that band happen. Hmm. It was going to be the band that finally got me the, you know, the, the, ex the experience I was longing for. You know? Right. And it was a great band that musicians were not uh, necessarily trained hotshot musicians like I play with now in a lot of, you know, recording situations. But they were just really good, solid players and had two really good songwriters. And they were doing kind of a Lennon and McCartney thing where they would put both their names on the songs they would write together. Mm -hmm. And so that band then, things moved pretty quickly. We put it together in 84... We started showcasing in 86, no, 85. We got a record deal in 86 with Epic Records. And then they put out our first album in 87. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that band toured all over the country. And we got airplay on rock radio. We had a MTV hip clip of the week video. You know, you had your typical 80s MTV video with a girl with, you know, cute girl in it. And right, right. Just a gas. I mean, it was, it was kind of like a dream come true, you know, mm -hmm. to hear here uh there's a rock station in chicago called wxrt that's been around for a long time and they're they're like the the ones that always support break bands they're like the cool station in chicago and they kind of continue to be yeah first heard our first single on that station you know <laughs> pulling into the driveway and like, there it is you know <laughs> the moment that you know you dream for if you want to be a recording musician you dream to have your band you know have their single on the radio you know? right so that that kind of went on for a while, and we ran into some issues in the music industry. I'll never forget. Um, the album had come out in the summer of 87. We were in New York City. I think we were playing the bottom line in New York City. And and because Epic Records was in New York, they would they would treat us well in New York. They'd put us up, you know, like on uh, Central Park and some nice hotels. Yeah, yeah. Rockstar. It was all on, on our future dime, I'm sure. Oh, God. <laughs> no, I'm, let's not go into that. But, You're right. <laughs> but I remember waking up like after the gig and turning on the news on whatever October date it was, and it was the stock mar market uh, crash, mm. the fall of '87, which was similar to what we went through in 2008, 2009. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if it was quite as severe. But what what it did do is uh, CBS came in. Uh, I'm sorry, CBS owned Epic. Uh, Sony came in and bought CBS. And that was just when that first Insiders album was starting to climb and it was doing pretty good on the charts and they were trying to push the single from, it was top 10 AOR radio, they were trying to push it on the top 40. Mm -hmm. Right at that time, all the plugs got pulled because suddenly Sony owns CBS, heads were rolling, oh. we lost our A&R guy. It was, it was your tragic music industry story. Yeah story for people that think that you know you can put your your career in the hands of corporate america and you're safe you know right uh, we just didn't make it over the hump i think the timing was just off yeah had we, we could come out maybe earlier in the year and we had a good solid year of touring behind it we would have been strong enough to withstand that mm -hmm. 
so then it went into all sorts of nightmares where we recorded a second album that didn't come out and it, the whole thing just kind of fell apart yeah we started releasing our own albums because the band was so good I mean, yeah Chicago, we toured around the midwest quite a bit um and we just we couldn't say no we couldn't hang it up you know we, we just believed so so strongly in ourselves and it just kind of wound down in the in the midnight mm. at that point that's when i was talking about thinking about going to nashville at that point i had to kind of reinvent myself you know i had to do the insiders the way i did i had i had given away my teaching schedule and that i had developed in the 80s mm-hmm. wedding band in the 80s okay um with some really good musicians but it was a wedding band you know right um i gave all that away to go on the road with the insiders and make that band happen yeah this, for it right i'm gonna i'm you know and we were like living off my wife's income and you know it was it was some mean years had to and, start from scratch yeah so um that's when i kind of reinvented myself and started to to expand more and think about being the jack of all trades drummer that can play on any session i get called for right you know i i got involved with an irish band playing uh irish folk music which cool. i still love that yeah i started playing more country gigs and country sessions mm-hmm. um and uh and then i met this a gentleman named jim peterick who is probably not known too well outside of chicago he had a band called uh the ides of march which mm-hmm. is the Together. They had a big single in 1970 called Vehicle, um, which you may or may not know. If you played in a wedding band, it's a horn song. Um, uh, it's not ringing a bell, but I'm, I'm, it's one of those songs I'd probably know it if I heard it. Like da 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 da. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's a horn. It sounded kind of like Chicago. You know? Right. So Jim wrote that. And that was a big single for them. And then that band fell apart and he formed Survivor. And he's the guy that wrote Eye of the Tiger. Wow, <laughs> all their other all their other big hits. He was the main songwriter in the band. Yeah. So he had fallen out with Survivor in the '90s when things started to slide for them. You know that Survivor was together from the late '70s through the mid '90s, and in the late '90s he was putting together a project called World Stage. Mm-hmm. It was he was going to make. Uh, an album with a bunch of his guys that he knew from the industry. They were all going to write songs together and they were going to do a show. And I happened to be playing with a girl singer at the time who opened up for the Ides of March. He had put the Ides of March back together. And uh, Jim came and saw me after our opening set and was like, who are you? And where, where have you been? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I got involved with him and, and I've been working a lot with him ever since. And uh, doing all sorts of stuff. He still has the Ides. Mm -hmm. Still have their original drummer. But um, Jim has a project called Pride of Lions, which sounds kind of like Survivor. Uh Uh, We record for Europe. And we have a deal over in Europe. And we go over there and play every once in a while. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Because that that seems to be one one of your main things these days as far as playing live. Yeah, that's uh, and Pride doesn't play that much, but but we do. You know, we'll go. We were over in Milan last uh, fall playing, and we'll do some shows around Chicago. Um, and it's a Survivor sounding band. With he found a singer with a four octave range. You know, yeah. so high types of you know things. Uh, you know that type of music. People don't really are not that interested in in America right now for new versions of that. If they if they want to hear that, they want to go back and listen to the classics. Right. It's amazing. I don't know if you've done any playing over there, but yeah, they uh, they revere all all sorts of American music, and and they don't look at it like, oh, that's from twenty years ago. It's not cool anymore. They don't have that attitude. You know, it's, if it's good and they like you, it's still they support it. Yeah, yeah. Great, as you know, it's a great place for American bands to go over. Yeah, and I, I think um, part of it has to do with just uh, there's there's a greater uh, European appreciation for live music of any sort. Um, I think whether whether or not uh, you know Europeans would would go buy that record um, from Survivor or whatever. Like if that if if there's a live show happening, they'll be there. Yeah, right, and they're and they're appreciative audiences, and they're great to play play for. Agreed. No, a lot of and jazz musicians wind up over there some of them living over there you know, yeah just 
revered over there, and they can they can make a better living playing over there than they can in the little tiny jazz clubs around. Yeah, it's so, true. So yeah, Pride of Lions is one project. Uh, Jim has a uh, smooth jazz band, which uh, called Life Force. Uh huh. So involved in, and that's gas because it's all a lot of funk stuff. And, yeah. And it's a side of drumming that I love that I don't get to do enough, so I enjoy doing that. And then uh, Jim has uh, three recording studios, two in his rather large house and one in uh, as an outside site. And uh, I'll do session work in those for his engineer, you know, from time to time. So yeah, I'm kind of an important person in my life in the last, I'd say, 15 years. Yeah. And with, I'm working on a show to, to play with him next weekend. We're doing a corporate kind of a fundraiser thing down at the House of Blues in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And it's this world stage uh, band, which is basically a core band with various guest vocalists from like 80s, 70s and 80s bands. So um, I'm learning uh, four big hits from Badfinger because we have Joey Molland on the show. Uh-huh. Songs are fun to play. Um, we have a guy named uh, Bill Champlin who's, uh, who was played with Chicago for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a guy named Alex Lidgerwood, I believe is how you pronounce it. He was sang with Santana. He sang on a couple of big Santana hits, so we're going to do those. And uh, there's somebody else on the show. Uh, can't get who it is. Oh, uh, Nelson, Ricky Nelson's kids. They had that band Nelson with uh, in yeah, a hair band. Right. So you know, for that type of a project, I go in and learn songs and try to play them just like the record. Right. Get like one dress rehearsal with these guys, and then we get on stage and back them up. And you know, you pr- you want to make them as comfortable as possible, right. so I'm as accurate as I can. Yeah. And that's cool too. It's a whole different mindset. You know, you're trying to recreate it. It's like off the record. You're trying to get in to the, those licks and really play them. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of, of being a, a, like a, a classical percussionist. Cause I, in, in college and grad school, I was, I was heavy into the classical thing and, and it's, it's kind of the mindset of like, I, I have to execute something. There's a specific thing and I got to do it that way. Like a, a, a drummer that, that does shows. You know? Yeah. Good friend who, who was in Blue Man Group for a while in Chicago and mm-hmm. so called Million Dollar Quartet for a number of years. And, and that's a, you know, that's a show that you got to hit your marks, you yep. know, and it may not have to be note for note every night, but it's got to be pretty close. Right. You know? Right. And so that's kind of like that, except when we do these things, they're, they're one or two shows and that's it. Mm-hmm. A lot of work in for just that one or two shows. Uh, and there's a little more leeway. I mean, I, I, I won't necessarily play every single fill exactly the same. I don't know, you know, unless I have it all written out on a chart, you, there's no way you can memorize it all. You right. Know, able to put some of your personality in there, but you're trying to recreate the song. Right. And again, like you were talking about, if you, you know, if, if through the rehearsal process or the first gig or the first couple of songs, like if you feel you've gained the trust of the people in front of you, then you can, you can, you know, put a little bit more of yourself in there. Yeah. But like, if it's an iconic song, like a year ago, we, we worked with Bobby Kimball, who was the original singer of Odo. I play Rosanna. Oh man. <laughs> and so it was, I wanted to nail that sucker. You know? Yeah. I worked it up and played it as close as I could to Percaro, who I dearly loved. Yeah. So, you know, to get to play his part with the singer that sang the song was cool. You know? Yeah. Like a, and again, this is from working off the record and being a teacher all these years, um, I try to like what I do this when I'm teaching songs. I have a bunch of rock charts that I teach my students when they're ready for them. I try to put myself in the shoes of the drummer that played the part, and you know, almost like you're you're pretending to be him for a second so you can think like he thinks. Mm-hmm. It'll help you figure out how he played a, a certain lick. So when that triplet thing came around, I was like, this isn't a standard sweep around the set. There's something else going on here. And I had to really think it out and figure out, okay, how's this going to be comfortable? Not only do I have to execute it, but I got to do it perfectly in time, hit that offbeat and come slam it back in on the, on the, you know, halftime shuffle thing. Right. I got to find a way to make this comfortable because I got to do it in front of a thousand or 2000 people. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's cool in a way. It's a good, it's a good exercise for any drummer to, to really study a part like that 
and try to really nail it note for note. And I think it expands you as a player and gives you ideas and uh, um, it helps you learn more about people you like, you know? Yeah. You can almost kind of start to think that way they think. Cool. Well, man, thank you so much for taking the time and, and thank you for being the, the tip of the spear to, to introduce the Working Drummer Podcast to Chicago. All right, Zach. It's been my pleasure. There you go. Ed Breckenfeld, Chicago drummer. And I must say a great example of that down-to-earth friendliness the Midwest is known for. Like I said, we hope to hear from more Chicago drummers on the podcast and we're so glad to have Ed as the first. You know what I'm going to say now? Follow us on social media. You know what I'm going to say now? Follow us on your social media platform of choice. Share episodes if you dig them. Share your gig pics and videos using the hashtag Working Drummer. Leave us a rating and review on iTunes. Tell a friend about us. Lots of ways to help Working Drummer Podcasts get bigger and better. And we thank you for all of them. Thanks to Mike Jackson for his technical assistance. Matt Krause will be back with you next week. And until then, be well, play pretty, and thanks for listening. <laughs>